Welcome back to the Legend Rouge Cycling Podcast for the recap of the men's Paris Roubaix, starting from Compagne to Roubaix. This is at least somewhat n nearer to Paris, uh, Compagne, but not in Paris. But we don't care about that. The Giro is going to start in Albania next year, apparently. So <laughs> it's close, en <laughs> close enough. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Join Cycling, the LRCP official training partner 260 k's long the first 100 k's are not no they're not flat but they don't have cobbles on them there's actually some rollers in there before 29 cobbled sectors uh finishing in the Roubaix velodrome the first four are actually in my opinion some of the hardest and longest in the race quite mm -hmm. really quite decisive particularly the new briast uh sector after the saint python sector then there's a flatter, some, it's a bit chills out a bit to Dunna. Then there's Avlui Waller on Trier Darenberg, for a four and five star sector, which will, we just know, will open up the race. And then there's Monzon Pavel, Carrefour de Labra, or she, or she, or she, around 60, 50 Ks to go as well. Uh, before, yeah, it actually gets easier after Carrefour de Labra, well, easier, 15 Ks of uh, mostly tarmac to the finish. So 55 Ks of, of cobbles. Big strong tailwind, actually, mostly tailwind, a little bit of cross tail somewhere, but a big strong tailwind uh, from the south. I think it was southwesterly today. Any, any news this morning, Benji? The yes. Free race. Oh, there was. Exactly. Dylan Van Barla, oh, out yeah, of the race. Yeah. DNS, Michael Vink, and Morkov as well. But let's be honest, those two weren't necessarily going to influence the race as much as a Van Barla would. So. That's something there. We already spoke about Pitcock being present a few days ago on the podcast, and that is indeed happening. He is in this race, and I don't know. I, I was going into this race with less hype than previous years, but it's still Paris Roubaix for me, you know, because Paris Roubaix is like it's my favorite race on the calendar. It's that race that I think about. It's got this captivating finish in the velodrome uh, after so many cobbles. It's really an epic fight between riders the entire time, and. I was curious where it was going to open up because I gotta be honest, I went into this race kind of expecting, if you look at Alpecin, you look at, at Trek, you're looking at two teams that they don't actually need to open it up early. Like, Peterson would probably want to, to leave it as late as possible, and Alpecin's strong enough that they can decide whenever to open it up. So, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting an opening as early as, as we saw today on today's race, but before we get into that, let's talk about the breakaway first. And, and to be honest, when it comes to that breakaway, the fight for the breakaway in this race is always chaotic as fuck, right? Because yeah. you've got a very fast opening. I think it was around 55-ish uh, K per hour first hour, which means very fast. And that is because everybody wants to be in the breakaway, because if you go back in history... Being in the breakaway allows you to be ahead once the favorites behind are just smashing it, which means that when they catch up to you, you're in a thin down group. You didn't have to fight for positioning when the favorites were fighting it in Trade Automate, for example. You were ahead when that happened, stuff like that. So that's how Adelier went to podium this race. Uh, 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 Heyman ended up winning this race from the breakaway. We always see anticipation moves really delivering in this race. But anyway, breakaway, Bertrand Hagenis from Visma. Rasmus Stiller from UNOX, Kasper Osgrim from, from Sudal's Quick Step. That's like going into this, when you see him in the breakaway, you still have that feeling of like, okay, it's Kasper Osgrim. But reality is that Kasper Osgrim 2024. <laughs> Kasper oh, Osgrim doesn't exist. He's, he's an illusion. <laughs> yeah, it's basically Kasper Pedersen, Kasper Osgrim's body. But anyway, Marco Haller, Liam Slok, Klep Siritsa, and Kamil Malecki. Once again, Malecki. Honestly, shout out again, this guy, it wasn't sure whether he could ride his bike anymore a few years ago in 2021 when he crashed and broke his pelvis and now he's, he's got a top 15 at RVV and he might actually be in the running at this point with this breakaway to get into the final of this race. So I was having an eye on him, but also on everybody in this breakaway. Where will, what will Hagenas do? Because he was one of those riders going into the world tour thinking, okay, this is pretty great, right? But anyway, breakaway aside. Were you, you my surprised? Friend. Well, I was surprised it formed without. I remember last yeah. year the break went to 170 k's to go, 100 yeah. k's, two hours of fighting. The Heyman year, where the break still won, where he won from the break, the break went after 80 k's there too, with yeah. with crosswind and tailwind. 
and, and, and that was two hours nearly of fighting. And RVV last year, it was a lot of fighting, but then, some, I don't know, just RVV last week, it was weird. The break went so easy. It was really strange. And then today, I was like, where's Jayco? Yeah. Where's Jayco jumping in this break with Volshide? Where's Trek jumping with Edward Turns or somebody? And, um, I mean, from Visma's perspective, that it was really, really good because, yeah, no Van Baal, you get your prospect up the road. I really thought this, okay, not the biggest break, like it wasn't 15 guys, but damn, it was super strong. Like, okay, what if Asgren's on his Tour de France week three day, like last year, where he just rode on the, on the front all the time. So it was, yeah, a really dangerous breakaway. It really was because, I'll repeat again, Heyman mm -hmm. entered Sector 1 and won the race from the break. Eventually, he got caught, obviously, but he entered Sector 1 with a 55-second gap in 2016. You don't yeah. need five minutes for it to play exactly. a big role. That is very true, but it's also a feeling of, like, the, the comparison when it comes to the breakaway formation compared to other years, sometimes it's as simple as a group forms, and then Alpsen reacts to the next one, and the next rider is like, ah, oh, shit, Alpsen's in my wheel, so I stop. And suddenly there's a gap of 15 seconds that everybody was looking for in like a split, split moment that people aren't reacting that it suddenly forms. And yeah, people can keep attacking to try and bridge towards that. But it became quickly clear that Alpsen wanted to control whatever was up the road as the breakaway. I wanted to keep it at that by reacting to counter moves. And I feel like Little Trek also was kind of vibing with trying to control the breakaway a little bit at first, but before we get to that, I've got a question for you. I've got a very important question. With your current fitness, you can't finish full Roubaix, but would you say that with your Fabio Jakobsen sprint training on join, would you be able to make the breakaway? In Roubaix? <laughs> I mean, Benji, I know we're doing a read for join, but like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> with Asgren, <laughs> I weigh under 70 kilos. <laughs> Remember, yeah. it's Gosper Peterson now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, let's do it. It's going to be doing seventy k an hour. But yes, but this is the this is the the beauty of that that Fabio Jakobsen sprint plan that I'm doing, which I was really happy about. Is that I've still got loads. Most of the workouts are the workouts I wanted to be doing in in preparation for summer. Two by twenty minutes zone three. It's still a gradual build. It's not a track program. It's as if you're yeah. You improve your sprint with sprint-specific workouts each week, which I did earlier in the week. But then you also, you still have to build your endurance. You still need to be more efficient at threshold yeah. to, to get in races to, or, or in your group rides or when Benji comes to the Andorra Enduro so I can smoke him in the town sign sprint. Hey! Well, you think this ain't free, buddy. You think he's going to rock up here and we're going to cruise around. <laughs> I'm ready for after that downside sprint <laughs> after I've done all this training yeah actually there, there are no places to do downside sprints in Andorra Mate. the downside sprints are on the 10, 10k climb I can't wait for the 25 second video on YouTube Benji versus Patrick downside sprint <laughs> well now we have to do it <laughs> so look out for that in the Jira but if you want to I mean join I did my best five minute power during a ramp test where you're doing uneven, you're going up every minute in power. I did my best five minute power during that ramp test on the trainer, by the way, mm -hmm. not even with great ventilation in five years after literally doing the recovery plan January and then my classics plan before we went to Flanders. So the plans for me have worked unbelievably well with the flexibility. Do I nail every workout every day perfectly? No, but I do 80%, 90%. I adjust, it's flexible, and I actually stay doing a plan, staying consistent, and it's really, really working for me. So if you want uh, to try out Joint, there's a 30-day free trial, no credit card required through the link down below, as well as six-month discount of subscription, which I know some of you have already taken advantage of after that free trial elapses. Thanks to Join for sponsoring our Roubaix coverage. And maybe, maybe in a year, Benji, I'll be in the Roubaix breakaway. I mean, the way Visma went this year... <laughs> Uh, we, <laughs> they might call you up. <laughs> uh, forget, yeah, you can be my rider agent. Uh, <laughs> or Jim, Jim, the, Jim, the CEO of Join can be my rider agent. Um, okay, back to the breakaway. Were you surprised yes. to see... That, oh, sorry, there was a crash. Yes, there was a crash behind the breakaway. That is true. And the peloton had multiple crashes, to be honest, throughout this race. But 
you know, it was a bigger one that included Tim Merlier, Laurens Rex, my man to win. Sorry, but I feel like I'm cursed here, okay? Not, not Rex, not the one on the floor. I'm the cursed one here. On, on a serious note, really sad to see Rex, Merlier, Betio, Milan, Viviani, all those riders on the floor. Multiple lotto riders involved as well. I think there was like 20 riders uh, on the ground, couldn't count them all, but Milan abandons, Viviani abandons. Milan abandoning actually has a consequence on this race, I reckon. Like, I was expecting Milan to play a role in team-based stuff when it comes to when it comes to Trek. That was my opinion going into this race, and him going away takes that opportunity away. Rex being out of this race is fucking sad. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I was hoping he would win. But <laughs> I was hoping him for him to be that dark horse win, but it ain't happening. So that crash happened and I'm gonna say it already, Rex later crashes again over like a, a traffic island thing with amazing yellow padding on it. So props to that because that that made him flip over it, but in a relatively fashionable way. Otherwise, he straight up hits the post. So I'm glad that that padding was there. Is what I'm trying to say. But anyway, back to you, little Trek. Was that the question? Well, when this is what often happens, the break was at twenty five thirty seconds, and then when there's a big crash in the peloton. Then the break gets another 30 for free because everyone's yeah. like, what's happened? Who's, who's in my team this crash? It was a big crash and you're tiling down, like a lot of guys down. Milan eventually got up. He got up, then was out of the race. So I don't know if, yeah. he, if he broke something, collarbone, whatever, but I was, he was up quickly. But yeah, Viviani looked really, really bad. I hope he's okay. It's been a, a terrible... Yeah, it's been a terrible week for oh, two weeks for crashes. And so this break is gone. I was surprised though. Milan out. Yep. MVP dominant in Flanders. Alberson team is stacked here, by the way, as well. Yes. And Trek put the clerk on the front and does, I would say, over 50% of the pulling behind the breakaway. I was like, why are you helping Alberson? They got all these, mate, they find these guys at Kermesses. I pay them 50 grand. And it doesn't matter what their name is. I swear to God, Plankart, Kielich, Vermesh, <laughs> Riesbeck, it doesn't fucking matter. They get these guys in and these guys are going to enter every single sector. First five wheels. They're going to be in position on the crosswinds. They're going to, yeah, keep NVDP safe. Don't help them because they're like, they're so good. But uh, I guess, yeah, he's there helping. Yeah, it's, it's playing into the hand of Alperson. I agree with you. Like, on one end, you could say that Peterson is closer to being a, a co-favorite in this race compared to RVV, but I still wouldn't have done it. I still wouldn't have had a little track pace, you know, because you're simply reducing the energy that Alperson has to spend before the couples arrive while increasing the energy you spend before the couples arrive. So that's a conclusion on that. And Vroom, we're now at the couple sector. Yes, I fast forwarded the race. 160k to go, sector 29, Trois-Villas and she is a fast sector, and mate, there's one person that started this race, that has been sick for a week or a week and a half, that couldn't ride RVV, that is probably the most cursed rider in this race. Is it being cursed, or is the skill issue? Oh, it's not, it's not, just, it's not just bad luck. <laughs> like Laporte, he literally first call sector, bang, flat, see you, out of the race, gone. Because, listen, the out, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's the way they're fl the flatting him in particular. Yeah. But, like, how many times does an Alperson rider flat in the first 50% of a sector and not make it through the sector close yeah. to where they can then choose to repair their mechanical at a good time? Like Philipson did today. Like yep. Philipson flatted on Arenberg, but he still was not fully flat. And so I don't know what it is, but yeah, like Laporte. And Alberson just starts smashing. They have, as I said, Planka, Kielik, Riesebeck, Riesebeck in particular, Philipson, Vermeersch, Van der Poel, the whole team's at the front, and they are obliterating the gap to this breakaway. Like they are in position, launching it every single sector, going so, so, so fast. And there's splits, like Laporte, he's not coming back because he's flatted, it's a 2.5k sector, you have to wait, ride that whole sector on the flat slowly. You race it over. Um, and uh, there's other riders flatting, there's other riders crashing, Riesebeck I think had a flat or crash, but they just continue smashing, and I can't remember what, 
where the exact before which sector the crosswinds were, but they even sent wow, it in some sir, crosswinds. Sir, you got to mention the legendary puncture of Gleb Siritsa on the second sector. Come on, gets caught by the peloton. I don't know why Wellens was suddenly at the front of the peloton on the second sector, sector 28, if he has Lia Kievi. But anyway, you're right, there were echelons, and it's after sector 27. Kievi a Saint Piton. It's a sector where, on the sector itself, yeah, they were already pushing Alpecin, like you mentioned, on multiple sectors, Alpecin pushing, keeping tempo, but I felt like it was hard tempo, and I felt like Vermeer wasn't just doing tempo. It was, he was doing, doing tempo tempo, and tempo tempo is harder than tempo. So that's what Vermeer was doing. After the sector, they keep rolling, like you mentioned, in an echelon formation, and what I don't know is, was Peterson gapped at the end of the cobble sector or in the echelons just after? Because I saw the split after, but I'm not sure where Peterson was caught up in the second, whether it was on the cobbles or in the wind. I'm not sure it was, I think it could have been, the answer's kind of both. Like there's a little gap and then Alperson just rip it and then after the cobbles and they turn, they turn right into that cross. Like Alperson didn't even, Van Poel said after the race, oh, we didn't really have like a, a plan exactly. They really feel the race. No, like yeah. they, they start riding and then they're like, oh, there's a strong crosswind here. We're all in position and they just start sending because they're all in good position. So why not send it? And yeah, yep. that really, that ends Laporte. That makes uh, Pedersen have to come back uh, as well. Uh, and Pedersen, yeah, has to pull back himself, basically. Tarling has mechanical yeah. at, this, at this point, which is he made that group. There's still, uh, I don't know where, where they catch the breakaway. Well, the breakaway is caught basically five kilometers after sector four, the Vieslia Biriastre sector. And that's after that mechanical of Tarling. And so with about 142 kilometers to go. And up till now, only one notable thing happened next to what we said, which was basically a crash of Rizebeek on one of the sectors, which takes away a potential rider as domestique for Alpesen. I don't know whether Rizebeek was able to come back or not from that, because there were a lot of Alpesen riders, and I couldn't figure out who was who all the time, but Kili was at the front then, and, and Van Meer was still there, and there were so many riders of Alpesen at the front that they were clearly well represented. And the next point is, related to that mechanical of Darling, we see a shot from the helicopter where there's an Ineos car vibing through a road, like, vroom like crazy and apparently tarling was holding on to the car holding on to the bidon i don't know well, no apparently you can see <laughs> yeah. no, was it no the car or the bidon? Uh, i think he had a bit on i think he had a bit on okay so is it as bad as nibali then because nibali velta held uh, on to the car no that was worse don't, don't, <laughs> that was worse come on <laughs> give this to a nibali fan he did a nibali knew, come on it was funny listening to eurosport comms because they were like, oh, that's a long, sticky bottle, calling it out. And then they went, oh, for Tarling, we shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> Blythe, Blythe was like, he was, he was having a shocker today, but I didn't know what was going on. Um, but <laughs> the, <laughs> and then I, was, I, knew, I knew he'd get done. Because yeah. if you're caught on camera holding the bid on or the car that long, then you're going to get on camera, it's mm -hmm. all over. Uh, generally speaking, now sitting behind the car like Ekhoff, I, I have to mention Ekhoff or Luke will get mad. Sitting behind the car, it's luck of the draw. They'll probably turn a blind eye to it if you just sit behind there too long uh, and it's not on camera too long. But I will ask you the question though, like when I was at Tour Montalia, when I was in the team car, shit happens behind the scenes that is not on camera where you've got people holding onto cars, you've got people holding onto stick bottles. How many people do you reckon did what Tarling did today in today's Pyro Bay at the back of the race? That's a good question. <laughs> I'll just continue. I think Patrick just fell out. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, we've got... He's back. He's back. I'm back. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Shit happens, Benji. That's all I heard. That's what I did. <laughs> anyway, your own I was asking you... I was Answer asking yourself. you... <laughs> How many people did what Darling did, but not on camera today? Today in the race, at least 15, at least 20 <laughs> riders. You know what, you think turns and those guys just come back after a flat. They have a flat and then you see them back in the back of the group in two minutes. You're like, come on. Um, but don't get caught on camera. So it's unfair in that sense, but also not unfair because I think everyone, I think everyone knows the... Really, like, if you ask most of the DSs, if you get seen doing that for that long, will you get DSQ'd on camera? 
I think most of them will say yes. So Mate, I don't I don't think it's particularly You just unfair. got DSQ'd on camera. <laughs> exactly. So Tang's out of the race. That's a shame for him. I would have liked to see how far he could could have gone to the race. Breakaway's been caught, which is crazy. 130 gap. Alperson close it after four yeah. sectors or so. They close to Asgren, Tilla, Harganes, Melechki, like crazy. And they still have riders. That's but unbelievable. I do want to know it because like, we're now 120k to go, sector 23 to 21. We're not at the Truid Eidemag, not at the Forest of Valers yet. And Alpacin is controlling that group of 40 that just got the breakaway, including the breakaway riders. Being in the breakaway still helped, right? Because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. would someone like, let's say, Leon Hagen is, Slock? Hagen is or Slock don't make the split, I don't think. So it helped, I guess, because... I don't know where Hagen has got in the race at the end because I think he had a puncture somewhere or was it not I him? Yeah, maybe. But the point is like he went deeper into the race same with Schlock than, than he would have otherwise because if you go into the first four sectors, saint Python or Briast, yeah, probably you don't make the split. Uh, and we see in that group going towards Havluia Wale. I, I, I thought, I couldn't believe it. I thought Pedersen's there Alberson will slow down. I was like, why would they keep pushing Benji? Like, Laporte's at like two minutes. Forget about him. Why would they keep pushing here before Havlui? And I thought you'd see an FDJ anticipation, but they couldn't mm -hmm. because Alberson kept pacing yeah. at 55 kilometers an hour all the way through Dana, all the way to Havlui Awale with Vermesh, with Kielich. And no one could do anything because in theory, okay, the break is caught. Surely if you're ASCII, if you're a Van Dyke brother, mm -hmm. if you're a Geordie Mayus, if you're Fred Wright, you're thinking, fuck, do I want to go to Arenberg with Pedersen and, and Van der Poel? Not particularly. Or, or Avluia Wallers. And so you try to get ahead, but no one could. That, like the pace was too high to do anything. Exactly. And I gotta be honest, then like a series of mechanicals started happening, right? You've got Ford having mechanical, Segard, Von Gestel, all these riders eventually, I think eventually all three of them might have actually returned from that. And then Hillig nearly rides into a wall in one of the corners, but this is all in the running towards those sectors, like you mentioned. Havli Ovales, Arenberg, and then we've got it. The magical not chicane. I gotta be honest, when the group was 35 riders, I expected them to go through it like smooth butter. Like, if 80 to 100 people go there, then you will have trouble, I think. But 35? Should be okay, right? Yeah, and it was. There's no issues. Like, but seriously, if, if a full peloton went to that chicane, I'm not saying there'd be crashes, but your race is completely over. And you, you, your, your race is finished if you're behind P30. What are the odds that the people were, that are like, that like put the chicane there for safety are going to be tonight? Like, oh, we did it. We solved the issue. We solved the problem, the safety of Adam, buddy. Because it went well this time around with 35 people. Well, I mean, did the chicane being there and Van der Poel not wanting to risk it mean that that's why Alberson pushed so hard, not wanting a full know. peloton into after Have Louis? So in this, because it influenced Alberson's behavior, maybe it did inadvertently make it safer. Uh, I, I don't know. And certainly on Arenberg, we didn't see... By the way, the, the group, whatever group behind this group of 30, 40 riders, yeah. I, we never see another single rider of them Narnia. ever again. Like the first sectors, they're finished. So... Uh, just pretend they don't exist. So maybe there were crashes on Arenberg in that group. I don't know. Or well, the chicane. We only saw one, one run of the uh, of the chicane on Arenberg. Yeah, uh, Van Dyke, Mick Van Dyke's in good position. Tim Van Dyke's in good position. Hagen is the lead out for them. And MVD Pool, MVDP starts opening up. Pedersen, Philipson, Mick Van Dyke. There, Tim Van Dyke has the mechanical. MVDP's already gapping Pedersen on the Arenberg, and he's not really trying. He's yeah. just kind of doing it his own pace, and he's putting him on a gap, which, and Pedersen looked like he was really blowing, so, and Philipson's right there in the wheel. So we have, we come out of the Arenberg, Van der Poel, Pedersen, Philipson, Mick van Dijk. Was there an FDJ or not? Uh, nah, I don't know, actually. Pedersen, and, and they start rolling. Pedersen starts pulling, van Dijk won't pull. And uh, in fact, they only stop when Philipson has that mechanical where he's like, oh, he tells Van der Poel and then Van der Poel stops. Yeah. So the group comes back. And this is this phase from here to maybe Volang or Brion. It's not Spanish, Brillon, I don't know. 
is this 20k <laughs> this 20k phase is the riskiest for Albertson in the race because Philipson's back Kielich and Riesebeck are gone Vermeersh is there but there's actually quite a lot of riders there's multiple UAE Wellness Pollard there's Tiller Vorenskold there's three Vismas there's Pithy Kung Aski there's Sergar Slok uh, Bora and now Philipson's off the back, coming back from a mechanical, and there's actually quite a few bit of tarmac sectors. This was the risky part for them. But I will say, I think initially they handled it perfectly. As in, Van der Poel was still ahead in that group of four. Then the group of Philipson was behind that. And we got to keep in mind that at this point, Vermeers is also there. Van der Poel stops when Philipson has that puncture, stops pacing at the front. Philipson is out of the group with Vermeers. Then the first two groups come together while Vermeer is behind. And then in that first group, while well, well, Philipson is behind, sorry. And that first group, Vermeer starts trying to control the things that happen. But that's when I think the first little mistake of Alpeson occurs where Vermeer does an attack. Then it looked like he was being called back, no? Like he stopped his attack in the middle I of his attack and looked backwards. Well, because Pedersen was behind because he had a mechanical. And so well, I, this was before Peterson's mechanical, oh, really? when Philipson was still behind. Okay. Well, yeah, when, when Vermeer think... went with three riders, so with Paulit and Kung, if I recall. Yeah, so he jumped, Paulit Kung joined him, and you see that oh shit moment from Vermeer. like, oh, I didn't actually mean, mean to bridge two of the strongest <laughs> rulers in the race. And you can tell this is why this is the only maybe mistake Alison made, or because it was a masterclass from them today. But this is yeah. the only place where you see MVDP mildly uncomfortable. And this is why Trek bailed them out. Watch MVDP's behavior as that group of three are going. It's the only time he started not to, well, yeah, to panic a bit. Yeah. Where he started to jump towards them. And you know what he did? He thought, fuck it, I'll let Pedersen come back. They'll put Varchek on the front. I got Vermeer up the road and it all's going to be gravy. And that's exactly what happened. But I don't, there was a moment there where he thought, ooh, I actually don't want Kuhn and Pollitt to just go and get two minutes for free. Yep. Because, because no one else no one else is going to help Van der Poel. No one else was chasing, even though even if they weren't represented. They're not going to help him. But uh, yeah, Varchek comes back with Pedersen. Yep. Drake put him on the front and uh, happy days Turns. for Alperson. Turns, Turns even well. comes in. Keeps helping as well. And, and it's really dragged that pool, Van der Poel and Philipson, back to the group of Vermeer. So the same strategy, to be honest, that, that Milan was pulling on on Alpesen on Van der Poel himself in Gent Wevelgem is what Alpesen is now applying on on Trek, which is I don't know, like on one end you can say if, if Trek don't close it, who will? But on the other end, like if you're scared that a group of Vermeers, Kung and Polit are up the road, then well then you're you have to choose between putting your man at the front and playing into Van der Poel's hand or daring to make it uncomfortable for Van der Poel and Alpesen by having them in the car start to stress about Vermeers versus Pollard versus Kung, you know? Exactly. I would have... Unless you really think you're equal to Van der Poel, make it an Alpesen problem. Because what would, what would Alpesen do? What would Van der Poel do? I don't know. I think he would use Vermeer as a satellite rider from that point yeah. onwards. He would attack, but then he... On an easier cobbled sector, 75, 80 k to go, he would attack. He would create a split, but then he would have to work on the tarmac sections to get across, most likely. So, yeah, yeah Trek were riding. It's, it's like what happened in E3, basically. Uh, and uh, But yeah. yeah, it was also a badly timed mechanical. And so, yeah, Pollard and Kung, they're also not fully committing. Uh, Pedersen actually starts to close that group of Kung and Pollard themselves into sector 15. Uh, and basically, to me, the race actually gets quite straightforward here. Those two are closed down. Other riders try to anticipate, like Wellens, like maybe a Van Dyke uh, or Hagenes. Vermeersh is all over it. Like Vermeersh, and, and, and yeah. he's just covering everything once it comes back. He's in such good shape. Pithy's also trying to move. Uh, but then, yeah, it's, no one's able to get anywhere. And we get to Orshi. And Vermeersh gets on the front, paces. Van der Poel does the attack where he comes in around and then in front of him. And then Vermeersh obviously can't follow. And uh, Van der Poel goes away on Orshi. 
which uh, is one of the two sectors I think he might have attacked on, or she lives, or she last year, or the year before. Um, yeah, he goes, and, and that's really, from what we've seen in E3 and, and Tour of Flanders, that's the race over. But I found it a really, really brutal attack, the way he was able to create a separation that was so significant, so quickly on Orshi, that was, that was like, great to see, like, the it's gap that he sector, made. No? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not a four or five star sector, Orshi is Orshi is four star, Orshi is three star, so he's yeah. doing it on the Orshi sector, and the gap was quite significant. I felt like he immediately made a five to, made a five to ten second gap. Yeah, yeah. With his attack on the cobbles itself, and you see that, it's like he's like sprinting half in the saddle on the cobbles while doing that attack, like a seated kind of sprint. Was it 50 seconds at 1500 watts? It was a lot of watts uh, <laughs> for a lot of time, because yeah, then he keeps going. Uh, Pedersen tries to close it, but then I don't think people were relaying with him on the tarmac afterwards, yeah. and we immediately see the, uh, the race is over, because yeah, the, the group behind's not cooperating. There's Philipson and Vermeer just denying everybody, marking yeah. everybody. So what are you going to do? you got the best sprinter in the world on your wheel. you got Vermeer bodyguarding you, and... And the Van Dykes or Wiesmer aren't pulling and, and Kung and FTJ, they're not going to be enough, even if they do relay with Pedersen and Pollitt. He's also probably thinking of, of the podium correctly at that point. So that's the race. Yep, that is the race. But I will say, yes, we're talking about Van Der Poel riding away, but I think there was still something we need to note behind, as in the way Alperson controlled behind, really impressive. You mentioned it already that he did it, but... In the way that eventually a group forms, a chasing group with Peterson, Kung, Piffy, and Pollard. Philipson is in that group. And behind that, Vermeers is still controlling in the third group. And then eventually, we come to the point that the gap from Van der Poel to the group of Philipson, Peterson, Kung, Piffy, Pollard is so significant. We're talking one minute and a half, almost two minutes. It allows for the group three, which has Vermeers. The gap between them and group two is also quite significant. But bridgeable technically and while piffy crashes in group two he's now out of that group for attacks behind from group three and they basically start forming a group three behind the group of peterson kung Pollitt, and phillips and you've got Vermeers and piffy behind that and i'm not surprised that for kept going because I, i'm perfectly fine vulnerable has won the race like yeah, there's, yeah. there's nothing happening unless he's got bad luck or punctures or or someone throws a cap in his wheel because at 42 kilometers to go there was an image of someone that it looked to me like they were on purpose throwing a cap in his wheel no like yeah it looked like that that like for fuck's sake man like what gets in your head to do something like i can't get over that these people are are risking their lives already riding a sport that is so dangerous on cobble sectors that are that are crazy to ride on he's on Fucking Carrefour de Lard No, he's not on Carrefour de Lard that one. I think Mont it was Oshie de Zoshi or Mozan Pavel. One of the Mont two. It was late. It was late in the race. He was like oh, had okay. two minutes. And, and to do that later, to, uh, one other dude on Carrefour threw a beer at, threw a beer at Van der Poel. Like, it's always the minor people. It's like one or two in a crowd of a thousand, of a crowd of a two thousand, whatever, maybe more. But there's always a rotten apple somewhere that has to ruin it for everybody, and especially for the rider that is already putting everything on the plate and putting on an entertainment for us, even though, let's be honest, 50 kilometers solo, not the most entertaining. 60. 60 kilometers solo, ooh la la. But I will say again, Vermeersch, probably my MVP of this race. Yeah, Vermeersch was so, so good. Like, he was unbelievably good. And what was strange was when Pithy had that crash. Because, yeah, when Pedersen created that split from the bigger group with, like, Mikkels and uh, Wellens or, or Van Dijk in it, he... Kung then kept pulling with, with Pithy just dangling behind. That was very strange. Against Philipson and Pedersen, who are quicker sprinters than him. It made no sense why Kung would kept pulling. And it got worse because he got just straight up dropped on uh, one of the last guy, Kampfan Pavel or Kafur Lara. And so, yeah, he... Uh, he kind of flicked himself, whereas I think Pollitt stopped pulling and basically Pedersen just pulled the entire time in Group 2 for the last 20Ks, uh, backing himself in the final sprint. So yeah, Van der Poel wins by three minutes. Huge, biggest margin for a long, long time. Uh, ahead of his teammate, Philipson, so the same one too as last year. Pedersen, a deserved podium. Uh, probably, yeah, the third strongest guy in the race, or second strongest. Pollitt, fourth, just couldn't beat them in the sprint. Kung finishes fifth. 
Vermeersh uh, finishes sixth ahead of Pithy, who had a brave race. Tim Van Dyke was eighth, but he got relegated in the, uh, let's call it the bunch sprint. Yeah. Because uh, he went onto the red. He went too far off the velodrome, yeah, which he, he didn't really need to do. I don't know why he did it. I, I agree. Like, sure, if that's a rule, then yes, he went off course technically to surpass people. But sorry, but to me, it is not clear at all that the parkour ends where the blue line ends on the velodrome. That is not clear to me. That has never been clear to me when it comes to Paris-Roubaix. I don't think that's heavily pointed out rules. to the riders either. There's no way Van Dijk knew that. Yeah, but... I think I that thought, sucks. I Sorry. thought when he did it, I thought when he did it, I was like... Yeah. Mm. I feared it, but it's a fucking shame and I don't think he deserved that. Not gonna yeah, lie. and also, like, it's not like it was a lost by a wheel in the bunch sprint, so... He, he won easily uh, with stop and pedaling. But anyway, uh, Mayus 8th, Virus Gold 9th, Mathis Mickles actually finishes top 10 in Roubaix. Degen Kolberite, Van Hestel, Fedorov, Wellens, all in that group. Pidcock, uh, very brave, finishes 17th after starting. Good to see him finish with no, no crashes or whatnot. And uh, yeah, that was the race. So Van der Poel has... Five races this year. Tenth in San Remo, where he was maybe the strongest rider in the race, helping Philipson win. Won E3 in a 40k solo. Second in Van Vevelhem when Trek worked him over. And then won Tour of Flanders and Roubaix back to back. He's now won three Tour of Flanders, two Roubaix. In the last year, he's won Roubaix twice. Flanders, World Championships. Cyclocross World Championships. Uh, Milan San Remo if you just count an, an extra month so he is Van der Poel's improved a lot if you compare to yeah. like 2021 and 2022 Van der Poel has improved a lot in the last uh, year and a half and uh, he's clearly the best classics rider in the world and probably yeah. pro in terms of like level eras it's different because everyone's going to get faster like the guys coming 10th now finish Roubaix faster than the guys 30 years ago. But in terms of level of a classic strider, he's probably the, the best in, ever in history. Uh, it's only a matter of time in the next year or the next two years or the next three years that he surpasses the current record of RVV winners. I think winning four times would be a record if I recall correctly. Paris Roubaix have got Bonham with four. It is not unlikely that Mathieu van der Poel equals that by the end of his career. We're talking about a rider that unironically will in my opinion, likely end his career with a Palmares the same or higher, probably higher considering the CX he has next to that, than Tom Bonin in Classics, which, that's crazy to say. <laughs> as, as a Flemish person, even though, let's be honest about it, Macho van der Poel is Flemish now. We've claimed him a few years ago, so according to Sportza, he is Flemish now, so I'm, Luke is not going to agree with that, but I'm saying it anyway. Uh, it, it's... He's one of the best classics riders ever at this point, right? If not one of the best yeah, riders already. ever. Yeah, Where would you already. put him in like, it's difficult because we don't know the old era of cycling very well. Like, I, I gotta be honest about myself. I know the last 15 years of cycling, the last, no, more, last, last 23 years of cycling, maybe. I, I know quite well what happened and when. But before that, sorry, but I'm not an expert on that at all. Benji, to the I'll, point I'll, that, I'll fill you in on something. Okay. I never even watched Tom Bona win a race. Oh, fuck off. Well, I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't Mate, watching then. <laughs> I literally, eight days ago, was sat on my couch and I was like, let me rewatch World Championships 2005 and see Bourne win. <laughs> Maybe I watched the San Juan win in 2017. And I was like, is this, uh, is this Max Richese's predecessor? <laughs> this fella, yeah, you, when he's, he's last keep, win in 2017. <laughs> you got to keep in mind, also when it comes to like, is it weird? Like, I'm not a fond man i'm not a man that is fond of sports watching in any way but i miss the echelon infested tour of qatar every stage were echelons man yeah and even the world championships there were echelons uh are you trying to say that tom bonin's tour of qatar wins put him is that why he's above him did he pay yes <laughs> no I, wait 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 let me let me have this okay Let's start off. Stibar versus Van Avermaet. Who has the best bomb rest? Stibar versus Van Avermaet? Yeah. I Pretty don't... easy, right? It's uh, Van Avermaet, no? He won a monument. Yeah. 
FNAF mod versus, ah, uh, this will be before, I was gonna say Balan or something, but that's before your time. FNAF mod versus Sagan. Uh, Sagan, easily. Sagan versus Wout van Aert. Sagan. Sagan Felipe, versus... Felipe Pozzato against Wout van Aert. Ooh, Wout van Aert? I don't remember menu. Pozzato's palm rest, so... E3, Omlope, San Remo, GC, Torino, Plue, two stages of the tour. Okay. Sagan versus Vanderpool. Vanderpool. Right now already? Yeah. I think by the end of his career, yes. But right now, I'm not sure yet. Because three times world champions, plus Roubaix, plus RVV. Uh, it's, yeah, it's close. Yeah, 12 tour stages. But yeah, you're right. That, Seven green jerseys. Gabriel does all the ranking of all this. So there's like, a, he weights all the points and stuff. But Sagan never rode in the classics. He was never this dominant like Van der Poel. Um, why are all the old, like, pros so... Agitated? Immature. immature. <laughs> like, why are, they, why are they lacking his self? Is that maybe it's part of what it takes to be so good, you know, to get out after winning two times a monument in a row, to go out and, and, uh, and still train six hours every day to do it again. Maybe you do have to be a little bit uh, like that. But well, is that Bonin, for context, what did Bonin say, Benji? Was it taken out of context when it was translated to English? I, I honestly don't remember. Uh, I don't remember what he said. <laughs> I think he said, I did, I did what Matthew Van der Poel, his yeah. whole Palmares, I did it in a year. You, you need to add, uh, the context that needs to be added is the following. It was discussion, firstly, about the amount of days preparation that riders now have, saying that um, they now ride very little races compared to what Bonin did back in the day. Uh, and... As a conclusion to that, Bonin went and, and like half jokingly said, Well, I did what Vanderpool uh, has done in, 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 in the Palmares, Vanderpool's Palmares in a year. He, he jo half jokingly said, but you oh, only okay. half jokingly say that when your pride wants to say that, in my and opinion. Like, and Nibali having a go at Luca Vergolito, yeah. who like, like is a good rider and deserves an opportunity. Like, why are you punching down like that? Like, what is, and it's just they're losers. They're like, they won so much. Oh, this yeah. is a little rant I've been holding in for a while. Yeah. Because there was not, honestly, there wasn't that much to talk about the race. Like, Van der Poel's just so fucking good. But like, these people, <laughs> despite winning so much, they're still losers. Yeah. You can, as a person. I think, I think it's two things. I think, first of all, we probably underrate the amount of journalists that ask them questions specifically about something to that leads themselves. to such a sentence. So, for example, I'm, I'm now Fabian Cancellara. And press officer, uh, no, a press person, fucking uh, someone from Sportza goes to me and asks, okay, Fabian, um, what do you think about Wout van Aert's, the reason that he's, that he's not doing what Van der Poel is doing? And Cancellara needs to answer to that. And his take was along the lines of, oh, uh, he should do less throughout the season like Van der Poel. Now, of course, he's saying that in exactly the year that Wout van Aert is literally doing as little as possible and only focusing yeah. on two races, so it was the worst fucking timing ever. And it, it, that makes it sound like he's trying to, to kind of give, give his, like, like he's got, I feel, it makes it feel like he's punching down towards Wout van Aert that he's doing something wrong. That's how it makes it feel. Yeah, but I don't has, know how much no of that... He has no idea Cancellara. He's clueless. Well, I think we've seen quite a few articles of Cancellara the last year that I would say wasn't the best advice. Like, I'm sorry, but Van der Poel is like, I think we shouldn't underestimate. If you look at the history of how, yeah. how dominant he was today and in Tour of Flanders and in E3, like he destroyed everybody. Of course, Alberson today as a team were also by far the strongest team, by far, but he still did a 60 kilometer solo in Roubaix. Yep. Behind, you know, in front of really strong guys, Mads Pedersen, Niels Pollock, Stefan Kuhn. You know, just those guys aren't doing 200 watts on the flat. So, yeah, like doing a race here or there, like Van der Poel is so, so good. And the only person that could challenge him, it seemed like, at Tour of Flanders would have been a full form Poggy. Yep. He didn't go this year. Uh, I would have been keen to see how Peacock actually went at Route Flanders after finishing top 20 here. Like, yeah, but yeah, that's sort of the old legends discussion. It's like they're, 
it's the limelight so on Vanderpool, and he is so good that it's. I guess maybe yeah, they. they I feel think it's threatened by him. I think it's partially the press aspect, but also many. They they've got a pride that they want to protect. They look at their Palmares and they're like, oh, I was fucking good, and they they have a, an issue with someone of the current era coming close to that Palmares, and then they try and minimize the achievements of who is now sometimes. But I also yeah. feel like sometimes you do hear them. You do hear them some like Bolden has been very like positive about Vanderpool's career. That's why that one statement felt so off, yeah, yeah. off pace compared to the other. So that's why I'm, I'm somewhat defending him in that regard. But I don't know. With Conchilari, I'm not so sure about that, whether, whether it goes both ways. Oh, the Nibali one was definitely malicious. Ah, that one Nibali, was... Nibali can't handle people getting, yeah, yeah. getting stuff that he <laughs> do, uh, did or doing stuff better than him. That's for sure. He's a bit of a snake. Uh, <laughs> oh, you had on him. I guess. Yeah, I, I love Nibali. And I yeah, love him because a, he's I love watching him write race. I love his <laughs> tactics. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I loved it because he was a fucking snake. But with that, he was like, oh, Roglic, I'll co come to my house. I'll show you my trophy. Stuff like that. That's why I love <laughs> Nibali because he was fucking crazy. <laughs> I wish. That's the thing. I wish there was more shit talking in the current riders. Exactly. Like. It would make it much more interesting to me, but because I would tune in for the press conferences, maybe. Um, yeah. I know the sponsors don't want that, but I do wish there was more shit talking. Uh, but like American sports, maybe that's the beauty of cycling. Um, Lastly, yeah, Sagan versus Vanderpool Palmares right now. <laughs> I haven't looked at the. I haven't compared. Them da, 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 three seconds. Uh, Sagan, but by the end of next year, it'll be Vanderpool. Fair, I agree. Yeah, I don't know how you wait a Tour of Flanders versus a Tour de France stage. Um, wow, Tour of Flanders is much more than Tour of France stage. Dude. No, Come no, on, but like, how many is is it? Three, three to one. Like, what's the ratio? You know? Nah, a bit more. Uh, it's not more than three. Three Seven. Tour de France. Sorry, Benji, but like, no offense ben. to the Tour of Flanders, but it's not that big. I'd rather win Paris Roubaix than than seven Tour de France stages. To get paid. I would rather win the Tour de France stage yeah, sequentially. I'm yeah. talking about Palmares don't get you a house deposit. <laughs> this is why I don't know why these guys are all so agitated. They all made so much money. They have incredible Palmares. Relax. <laughs> exactly. To, like Trenton, Loki, very, very nice career. If you, if you worry about his yeah. contracts and his Palmares, like I wouldn't mind. I'll take Trenton. I'll take that. So there. Um, I mean, we've gone a bit. Uh, yeah, I like I like Mark. Mark's a great writer. Um, why we do have Mark and Rubey? I guess. Well, should we cover the? What are we gonna cover, dude? What? No, no, no. The 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 boring discourse. Like I oh. think you're entitled if you in the last hour of the race when Vanderpool's two minutes ahead to be like this is as a spectacle. There is yeah. not. It's not particularly enthralling in terms Fuck of suspense. Happening. Yeah, there's not particularly enthralled. It's like Mads Pedersen and do five for thir second, third. That is what, true on the one hand. We can have two things true at the same time. That's true on the one hand. And on the other hand, all we've just said about Van der Poel in terms of history, it's an incredible achievement. He is already up there with the greats, even if his career yeah. stopped today. You know, even they never won Roubaix like this, uh, this dominant. So the two things can be true at the same time. But my opinion on it is. Firstly, solely with this Paris Roubaix, I found it a good Paris Roubaix until about five to ten kilometers after Vanderpool attacked. which I think is a fair opinion to have. And it goes both ways. As in, on one end, a race can be so close with so little action like the Giro last year that it's boring. And it being close doesn't make it entertaining if nothing's happening. So that's one thing. And on the other end, when there's such a clear favor to the point that he's ahead already at that point in the race, when it's clear that he's going to win, it's okay to find that boring. You're, you don't have to... 
uh, lie about it just because some people on the internet or on TV are telling you, ah, oh, this is, we're watching a spectacle, you're never going to see something like this again. But the next week I put on my fucking TV and Van der Poel attacks with 60 kilometers to go again. Like, <laughs> sorry, but I've seen it last week. Come yeah. on. I mean, I also don't think the race was that. I'm sorry, but up since uh, the team time trial with 175 k to go, and, they did, and then they launched him on Oshi, and the race was over. Like, yeah, it was. It wasn't that much going on uh, either. So, uh, but that's fine, you know, sort of. Uh, I am a little bit worried about with the. Uh, it's not been great with crashes the last two weeks, but that's also part of the sport. Um, you know, some years are better than others. 2021. The Grand Tours were, were not so good, but uh, who knows what will happen. Uh, but certainly Alperson de Koenig, uh, after being a pro Conti team just two years ago, uh, they now, uh, yeah, they're the first team, I think, maybe ever to win the first three monuments of the season. So they're making history themselves. Um, and who knows, maybe Van der Poel will go to Liège. Maybe he'll go to Lombardia. Uh, I think it'll be a bit more difficult for him to win them, but... Uh, Quinton Hermans is certainly looking better. So <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yep. In Liège, uh, he, could, he could win. I don't know, is Poggy doing Liège? He, uh, he should be, right? Yeah, hopefully. Now Remco's crashed. Fucking hell. Um, yeah, so a bit tough. Uh, anyway, next, what do we got on this week? We gotta, uh, are we going to cover Brabant Chappelle on Wednesday? I'm down. Hmm. It's a good raise, usually. We'll do it. Come on. Ineos aren't doing it this year. Get out of your fucking bed. Let's do it. It's, uh, it's a bit of a weaker start list this year. I don't know why. I think... Uh, let's see the start list. I don't actually know who's going. It's... Yeah, not so good. No Visma, no Ineos. But uh, I think Mark Hirschi going to clean that. And then we wow. have... Amst then we have it's a pro raise, right? It's a okay, pro. he can. Pro, <laughs> and then we have uh, after that the Ardennes starting in earnest. That's the bridge from the Flemish Classics to the Ardennes is Brabant Pale, and then we have uh, Amstel Gold race that that weekend. And the next Wednesday is Flesh. Then there's Liège Baston Liège. Uh, but yeah, hope you enjoyed the Roubaix recap. Uh, we might see you with a, a weekly show tomorrow evening. You can you can mark that down in your little calendars anyway to keep you going because, as Benji said, I'm not allowed to rest. But until then, ciao.